Welcome to this session on implementing a human rights approach uh, with uh, people who use drugs. My name is Michel Kazachkin. I'm here in my capacity as a member of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. We're privileged uh, to have two ministers with us today and a, a remarkable lineup of, of speakers, Madame Angela Constance from Minister of Drug Policy, uh, Scotland, the Honourable Seth Kwame Achempo, Minister of State uh, from Ghana. We have Aticia Basim uh, from Input, Indonesia. Stefan Cutter, who is Head of Legal Services at Release UK. Uh, Julie Hanna, who is the director of the International Center for Drug Policy at the University of Essex, and Professor Alan Miller, um, chair of uh, National Collaborative in Scotland. We are particularly grateful to the co-sponsors uh, of recording in this progress. Event. That is the Scottish government, the Embassy of Ghana in Vienna. Good morning, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, the Norwegian Ministry of Health and Care Services, the International Center on Human Rights uh, at, uh, and Drug Policy at Essex, and the Global Commission on Drug Policy. So we are aiming at having a very concrete discussion today. What does it take to actually implement a human rights approach uh, when it comes to drug policy. A human rights approach to all aspects of policies that um, are today a challenge to people who use drugs in the area of health, in the social sector, in the from an economic perspective, uh, in terms of service provision, so um, I would like to call on the speakers to really think of implementation here, which are the challenges that people face and what do governments and uh, affected uh, communities, academia can come together and think would be concrete approaches to implement and we'll hear already implemented policies from Ghana and Scotland. Thank you for being here again. So uh, let us start. We have uh, 50 minutes. Uh, please, speakers, uh, stick to your seven minutes time. And our first speaker will be Madame Angela Constance, Minister of Drug Policy, Scotland. Thank you very much, Michelle, and good morning, colleagues. Can I start by expressing my thanks to Release for hosting and organising uh, this vital uh, conversation, which, as Michelle says, at its very core is about turning principles into actions, how we turn our words uh, into deeds. And I also want to recognise the contributions that fellow speakers uh, will make this morning, uh, who have been very much at the vanguard of that global shift towards a public health and a human rights based approach. And I'm particularly heartened and glad uh, that we'll also hear from Minister Seth Aikin Pong, um, who has shown uh, considerable leadership in Ghana, uh, which is all about making rights real for people. Uh, and that's what matters most. How do we implement our policies? How do we put that into practice? And how do we all work together to turn lives around? I'll just tell you a wee bit about Scotland. Scotland is one of the four home nations within the UK. We have what is called in Scotland a, a devolved government, where we have control over health, education, our justice system, with some partial powers 
on the economy, uh, tax and welfare. And the powers that remain reserved to the UK are those bigger uh, macroeconomic and welfare powers, uh, international relations and also drugs law. So in Scotland, we're in quite an interesting space between having uh, a, you know, a, a duty to deliver health, education uh, and justice services, but the framework, the legal framework, particularly with drugs law, uh, remains reserved to the UK. So our um, arrangements are similar, but with some differences um, to maybe state, federal arrangements and other parts of the world. So I'm Scotland's Minister for Drugs Policy. Uh, this was a new dedicated post created just over two years ago. And it's my job to lead a national mission to reduce drug deaths in Scotland. And the reason that this post was created was Scotland has the worst drug deaths rate in Europe. Uh, we also have uh, very high alcohol uh, related deaths as well. We are beginning to see some very early signs of progress. We're being quite cautious about this. So our suspected drug deaths uh, for 2022, which are published this morning, will show a 16% decrease. So our suspected, not confirmed, suspected uh, death rate is, is the lowest that it's been um, in five years. Um, the scale of the, the tragedy and, and the loss um, of individuals and the impact on families and on our communities in Scotland has resulted in that it's now accepted uh, that we have a public health emergency and an urgent uh, human rights issue. And the debate in Scotland has actually shifted to what does this mean in practice and how will we deliver uh, for our people? And our national mission is to both save and improve lives uh, by reducing harm and promoting recovery. And there are three parts to that. Part number one is our emergency response. This is about increasing the distribution and availability of naloxone through our emergency services, Police Scotland in particular, peer-to-peer -peer supply, uh, particularly for people being released from prison. We've got a click and deliver a uh, very innovative service too. We have uh, the UK's only heroin assisted treatment project in Glasgow. We want to do more of that. We are learning all the time from the very best of international um, experience and we are committed uh, to delivering safer drug consumption facilities and we are working through the delicate detail of how can we do that within the powers, within uh, the legal framework that's currently at our uh, disposal. The second part um, of our national mission is to reduce risk by uh, enabling people to access and uh, remain in treatment and recovery services. Um, we have a new treatment uh, target to uh, get more people into OSET. Uh, that will increase to other forms of treatment um, next year. We are um, really pushing for the implementation, turning around our health and social care system to implement what we call the medication assisted treatment standards. So this is same day access to treatment, improved choice. How do we reach people? This is about outreach. How do we retain them in treatment? How do we reduce harm? All of these core standards, but also connecting uh, to the broader social determinants of health, connecting drug policy and drug services to housing, advocacy, welfare, education and the much needed reforms that we are pursuing in and around um, our, our justice system. We are also increasing uh, residential rehabilitation um, because of some of the work we've done in Scotland um, demonstrates that people with multiple complex needs who would benefit most from a residential option, it's sometimes those people that find um, accessing those treatments hardest and we've um, opened some really innovative new services in terms of keeping families together, uh, child and mother recovery houses um, and a new family uh, residential rehabilitation service that can uh, help care for mums and dads uh, and their, their children too. Um, and thirdly, this is about reducing vulnerability and um, addressing the social determinants um, of, of good health. Um, so while my post is very dedicated to drug policy, uh, my poor overworked civil servants, we have tentacles in every part of government. So we have an, a new cross-government plan and this is about Team Scotland and how we turn 
what is a public health crisis around. And the golden threads that stitch all of this together um, is our lived and living experience communities. Uh, Professor Miller will speak about the work um, of the National Collaborative, and that's very much um, about ensuring that we're not just listening to the voices of real life experience, and that they also have the opportunity to shape what we do. So it's not just about what we do, uh, that lived and living experience are shaping how how we progress as well. And my final point, because I'm conscious of time, is that as a fundamental point of principle, um, we treat drug and alcohol problematic substance use first and foremost as a health condition. And we have a whole plan of action as a government about how we are going to tackle stigma because it's a barrier to treatment um, and we need to uh, kick stigma and discrimination um, into touch. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation and I hope I'm on time. You are. Thank you very much for uh, delineating these uh, three uh, ways of uh, approaching um, the issues and, and, and the overarching uh, health-based and, and human rights-based uh, uh, umbrella of um, uh, of approach. So, thank you very much, uh, Minister. Let me now turn uh, to you, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Minister Jampong, uh, with uh, a few words on the experience uh, in Ghana. It's a pleasure having you today with us. Thank, thank you for you. being thank here. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. I, I, I just want to take a quick uh, uh, time, just uh, uh, 30 seconds of my time to introduce my ambassador who's here. My ambassador who's here with the high power delegation from Ghana, the head of drug policy control, the agency that does enforcement for the Republic of Ghana. Ken is here with us. And... Uh, we have Africa's, um, as part of our Ghanaian delegation, one of Ghana's good people who has been helping with drug policy reform from the Civil Society Front is Maria Goretti, which most of you know already, and uh, our schedule officer for the CND here, um, Emmanuel. So these are the team that is supporting me here today. So I would just want to take a quick introduction for them as I proceed to Ghana's story. Ghana's story has been one that over a decade and more, um, we were just on demand and supply reduction as a practice for prohibiting people who carry drugs, who use drugs in terms of possession and at the same time for trade. And so as a destination where we were gradually becoming a transit area, uh, we were always looking at purely on demand and supply reduction mechanisms and measures in respect of drug policy reform. However, we as a country have signed on to all the international treaties of the United Nations. And so at the point in time when the conversation is changing, the narrative is changing globally, we are forced to immediately amend our way. So in 2020, Ghana enacted a new legislation on drug policy reform. And so we had a new Narcotics Control Commission, which is the Drug Enforcement Agency in Ghana. Therefore, fast forward, we have uh, gone further to develop uh, a master plan for policy formulation, assessing and reassessing the enactments we've already done. I must say that even before we could um, complete our regulations as in terms of instruments to complete the new law we had passed, um, some interested parties took us to the Supreme Court for some interpretation of some of the sections. And as a result of that, some a particular section that would allow us on alternative development was called to be an unconstitutional law. However, government is very resolved to help us come back to the table. And uh, it was a slim decision by the Supreme Court of Ghana, 4-3, and the administration is poised to overturn the decision. And we're hoping that in the next couple of months, this will be beyond us. Come to this, it became eminent on Ghana to hold 
a very important discussion, which was a national dialogue on the drug policy we were of. May I ask you to put on my slide so people can follow my story and then it makes it more related. So I give a narrative of how we started with our law and what does Act 10 19 in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And Ghana is signed on to all the UN um, treaties. On gas 2016, we're there. And then I talked about our master drug control master plan. That's the national drug control master plan, which is out of it is giving birth to a national dialogue where we're taking all opinions from all stakeholders. Please, next slide. I think I'm done with this slide. The national dialogue, we had sponsors and support this, and these are the advertised um, entities that assisted us in, in having a national dialogue. Please, next slide. So the conversation here is to discuss the content and implementation of the international guidelines on human rights and drug policy in the context of ongoing drug reform conversations, both in Ghana and within our sub-region. So this is to create space for state representatives where we have UN AIDS having our agency back home, the Ghana AIDS Commission, and other members of the public health institution where our new law, its main objective is to center conversations on drug policy on human rights and public health. So if this is the way to go, then we need to bring everybody in that sector on board. Open up to civil society to, for them to also have a voice. Because if you come up to this global platform, civil society is always ahead. It's just a major stakeholder. So the dialogue was to give all these facets of interest to come together under one umbrella to hold a conversation to help government formulate a proper policy to develop key recommendations for the next steps in the reform process, including identifying national drug control and human rights priorities, which is very key because we have already been practicing a certain culture that is purely on demand and supply prohibition. So we are in a new phase of introducing human-centered policies and it is proper we bring everybody on board so we can all share in the experiences and move on. Kindly move me to the next slide, please. So we need to go further. In the conversation, these were some of the points that members who, we, we broke ourselves into various groups and various working groups, we developed these outcomes. So urgent need for evidence-based drug treatment and harm reduction services in Ghana. Um, Ghana AIDS Commission is already practicing some syringes program, which is known in other parts of, 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 of this industry. However, it is not so eminent in Ghana. So it is good for us to scale it up. The need for opioid agonist treatment, such as methadone for people who inject drugs, because already people are having it on the streets in Ghana, because from our history, as I, I said earlier, we become a transit point. So all manner of drugs, both from the West and the East, you find it in our center because when it goes, when you become a transit point, come what may, some will remain in your in, in your neighborhood and people will use it. The Ghanaian justice system for arrest to sentencing is critically assessed for opportunities to support people who use drugs. In the new law, we took away custodial sentencing for people who possess and use drugs. And so you go through some fines and then the, that, that is how the new law puts it for us. So we needed to also encourage the judicial system of our country to come up to speed because if they were, they wouldn't have outlawed a very good provision in the current legislation. It was noted that Ghana's laws do not envisage an amnesty for people already incarcerated for drug offenses depenalized under the Narcotics Control Act 1019, that is the current act. So this is a matter that going forward, when we are looking for amendments, we will consider as part of the considerations. Alternative development is a very key matter for us because people, you cannot help them on psychotropic substances, they grow them. So small scale farmers have difficulty participating in the regulated cannabis market, which we are envisaging to hold because our legislation clearly did not give us the opportunity to do recreational um, um, cannabis. We are going purely for medicinal and industrial purposes. That was the essence. Please, next slide. So it was recommended by the group when we had a dialogue that the existing and newly developed drug services in Ghana are standardized, regulated, and gender sensitive, which includes inter alia having provision for 
child care provision for sexual and reproductive health care, measures to address gender-based violence. Because we are in the international platform, conversations looked into gender mainstreaming. And so we should also be sensitive as to the conversations around the table. So we're also not left out. Alternative livelihoods, I have spoken a little about them, should ensure that there is equal distribution of resources, gender mainstreaming of men and women and the specific needs of women must be adequately factored into programs. It is also recommended that women, particularly those impacted by drug policy, be included in drug-related policy discussions to better address their needs and concerns. You have women in farming communities and farmlands who primarily would have to take care of their children. And some may be vulnerable and may have to be couriers for some people who are already diverting some psychotropic, psychotropic substances. And what sort of uh, support systems do you envisage to offer them in the event of a regulated market where the licensing, as you may know, comes with a lot of... Careful. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. I, I know my time is almost gone and I wouldn't want to take too much of your of your time. Prof, I think I may end my story here during the question time and if any matter comes up for discussion, I will come. Let me take you through our little conclusions. I think we have some conclusions and I, I must say that we are working extremely strong on alternative development programs for local farmers, as I, as I said, in, in, on cannabis. And then a non-custodial bill is currently on the desk of the Minister of Justice. He's also government's Attorney General. And we are hoping that this will help us free our prisons. Overcrowding, congestion in our prisons is, is a major worry. We have NGOs back in Ghana helping us in that area. There are good examples where people have been reformed and they are put into proper economical use. They have been given all their alternative traits and they are working back home. And this is evidence-based and that is what gives us encouragement to continue in this path. And we're hoping that with these um, engagements, we will also learn from international experiences by way of helping to build capacity and engage various stakeholders, especially back home in Ghana. Our focus is on the judiciary. We need to, we want to encourage the judges and enforcement agencies, police. Drug enforcement agency in Ghana today is National the Control Commission, uh, the National Drug Control Commission. But they've also been given by the law, be given powers of the police uh, 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 as the police works. However, most of arrest is affected by traditional police and some of the methods and measures that are met out to would be offenders um, is fronts on the rights of, of, of the human. So we are trying to encourage them to also put human-centered uh, uh, practices in their way of arrest and management of, of, of the criminal justice system. I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, of speaking in this platform. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, and uh, so many lessons uh, to be learned as we listen to you. Thank you for um, that remarkable expose of your approach uh, uh, and this fascinating uh, process starting with the dialogue. Uh, in, in the first re ever report of the Global Commission on Drug Policy 2010, uh, we recommended uh, that the first step when thinking of, of changing reforming drug policy is to, quote, break the taboo and open uh, a dialogue at national level. And, and this is, I found your experience really fascinating from Great. that uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Great to now turning you. to um, Adisha, Adisha Taslim, uh, and now we'll hear from the ground. Uh, Adisha is with input, as I said, in Indonesia. Uh, Aditya. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Aditya. I'm with International Network of People Who Use Drugs based in the UK, but I'm living in Indonesia. Um, but first of all, I'd like to just stay, uh, begin with that, that, you know, this is beyond any of my wildest dream. Knowing my background, um, being, you know, having to sit next to ministers at this level, and it's just proof that um, um, the space for um, community to be able to speak uh, of our experience, it's possible to do. And also, thank you so much, um, Minister Constance, for highlighting the importance of having choices, because I will uh, also address that in my intervention. 
So um, I started using drugs when I was 13 years old. And by the time I was 16, I was expelled from school. And so technically, I've never actually finished high school. Um, I've been and I've also been sent to countless number of um, religious based, medical based um, rehab uh, without my consent. There was no options. Um, and um, it was against my will. And also I was sent away to live in another country only to find out that um, I was discriminated against um, because my passport was held up because of my HIV status and also my drug use uh, for almost a year. So I started working on harm reduction with a local community in Indonesia in 2005. And it was actually at the very early um, initiation of harm reduction in Indonesia. So you can imagine that we were very careful in um, doing so because we had to bring needles and syringes out to the streets, hide them in our bags, distribute them to people who use drugs, at the same time also educate them on the risk of sharing needles, but also risking our lives to be arrested by the police. And we've been arrested by the police because of that. And despite all the progress made with all the um, an investment coming to the HIV response on harm reduction, um, the situation remains the same today. Needle sense syringes are used as evidence by the police to arrest people who use drugs, whether it's people who use drugs on the streets or outreach offices. And services, even if they are available, most of them are inaccessible for many reasons like operational hours, they are not really fit to um, the needs of people who use drugs. And also um, distance could also be administrative requirements, um, including mandatory urine test for people accessing opioid agonist treatment. Um, and these services um, see, uh, many of these services see abstinence from drug use as the only indicator of success and therefore making it uncomfortable for people who use drugs in accessing them and most of the time avoiding them. Organizations led by people who use drugs also continue to be challenged, stigmatized and denied. It also happened to our own organization recently. An arbitrary and discriminatory decision from a financial service that input has been using for a few years led to freezing all of our accounts um, pr without prior notice and on unreasonable grounds. This was just last year. So for the whole two months, we had no access whatsoever to our account and uh, post financial risk because we couldn't really do anything. We can't send money to our partners and we it's, it, it's really uh, uh, a complete mess. Um, although this, although the successful advocacy efforts that we uh, we, uh, we we did through the support with the UK All Party Parliament groups for drug policy reform and the UK media, that led to the reinstatement of our accounts. The unprecedented situation highlights a major challenge and violation of human rights that even a globally recognized organization like Input, with strong support from the UN's international donors, and um, and, and member states face regarding unfair treatment in accessing financial services. And this further underlines that many national networks of people who use drugs are still unable to open an independent bank account due to organizational identity and name, which not only impedes on the rights of freedom to assembly and association, but also means losing out on the already scarce funding opportunities. For 40 years on, the global health human rights community um, continues to fail people who use drugs as key population in the global HIV response. But for the first time, the world recognizes the critical importance of societal enablers on the criminalization of drug use and possession, as well as the importance of the leadership of people who use drugs to the global AIDS targets are known as the 10, 10, 10 and the 30, 60, 80 um, targets. However, these global commitments are often not translated into national actions and countries continue to focus merely on treatment targets, leaving no space for discussion on decriminalization, societal neighbors and community leadership. 
And also just a quick reminder that these targets are set to be achieved by 2025, which is just around the corner. And we don't often talk about these targets at this space, at the CND. Since last year, input with the support from UNA's technical assistance mechanism, work with PKNI in Indonesia, Sandput in South Africa, and Dran in Nigeria, our uh, network members, as well as networks from Africa and MENA regions, and building the capacity of people who use drugs to really unpack um, the global targets and international human rights instruments, and creating creating a strategy and using them in advocacy for the criminalization, as well as funding for drug user-led responses. And most importantly, making it easy for community to be to be understood and making it in, 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 in a way that um, language is understood by the community. And later this year, we're also expanding our efforts by having a global training of trainers, bringing people who use drugs from, from around the world and for, for them to bring back to their community to hold the government accountable for their commitments and promises. And all of these drug user-led responses will only be successful and impactful with fully funded UNAIDS, since there are not many other institutions that are willing to fund drug user-led organizations. Worldwide, we only have eight countries that have to criminalize drug use. Well, some others have merely shifted towards administrative laws and penalties. They are still fueled on moralism, prohibition, punishment, and pathologization of drug use. So we call on member states to end war on drugs and to fully decriminalize people who use drugs by removing all administrative sanctions, including fines, mandatory report, revocation of rights, and privileges, police surveillance, as well as the immediate closing of all compulsory detention centers that are used in several countries, particularly in Asia Pacific. We, call, we also call member states to meaningfully involve people who use drugs, invite us to the table, not just as a requirement, but see us as an expert. By listening to us, we may be able to find a solution that speaks to the values and preferences of people who use drugs in accessing services. And lastly, in order to continue the advocacy on the criminalization and human rights for people who use drugs, drug user-led networks need to be invested, not only just through project funding, organizational capacity building, as well as access to adequate core funding are imminent for, for the sustainability of our movement. And let me close this by with a quote from our friend in Canada that goes, Prohibition is the reason we have all these harms. We are overdosing and getting harmed by, and dying because of the war on drugs. When we finally acknowledge and confront the causes of almost all the harms, which is drug prohibition, we will be much closer to finally putting an end to them. Until such time, harm reduction saves lives. Thank you. Thank you very much, Savitia, for that uh, powerful message uh, from you and input. I will now turn to uh, Stephen uh, Cutter from Release, and let me just take this opportunity. I mentioned the co-sponsors of this event uh, at the beginning, but at the top <laughs> of the initiative uh, is uh, Release and the remarkable work that this organization has been doing in the policy field and in delivering services in the UK for so many years. So um, this is to acknowledge, Neve, your work and that of your team. Thank you very much. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the panelists for joining us today. Um, so our organization provides help and advice to people with the legal and social problems that they have, and we respect the rights, uh, the choices that they make having received that advice. We find that this is a non-controversial position for many advice providers, but in a society where the stigma of drug use means that there is a status quo of coercive and paternalistic interventions, this approach is often seen as surprising, and this is indicative of the problems I would like to talk about today. This is because many of the people we support experience drug dependency, which is exacerbated or caused by structural poverty. People who use drugs are often othered and seen outside as being as seen 
are seen as being outside of social norms and stigmatized for their behaviors. We cannot separate that treating people as criminals is core to this experience of stigma, but it goes beyond the criminalization of drug use and pervades into socioeconomic structures. That stigma particularly affects those who develop a dependence and is likely to be felt even more sharply by those who have other stigmatized characteristics, such as physical health conditions or those who are neurodiverse. The stigmatization will often result in people being talked about by a range of services as being chaotic, high maintenance, drug seeking, or simply difficult to reach. There can be a misplaced desire to pathologize drug use as always being a form of self-medication. This is too simple an explanation given the many lives and motivations that make up our community. Just as people across the breadth of society use drugs, they are used for a range of reasons, from pleasure to a range of other beneficial reasons. Despite this, the present situation is a policy environment which seeks to coerce or control drug users' behaviours outside of the criminal law through broader socioeconomic policies. The result is that life is made harder across a range of legal areas, employment, family, housing, social security and health. These difficulties are compounded by the stigma of drug use. Many of our clients report that services that support the community as a whole are in fact often, often stigmatise them as individuals because of their drug use. This creates a hurdle to accessing help and advice in a range of everyday social issues. Those using treatment services have found them increasingly hostile and often unable to meet their needs. This follows a decade of focusing on abstinence-only outcomes and the result is a treatment regime of paternalistic approaches. For example, if someone is seen to be using on top of their script, then it is more likely that compliance will be sought by um, additional drug testing or increased monitoring and supervision. In fact, what people may need is a higher dose, a less regimented collection schedule, or to try alternative medications. Our advocacy tries to secure people the latter. Our drugs team provide advocacy on behalf of people having difficulties with their treatment providers, and we've supported people in bringing legal challenges against them. We assisted one group who had been in receipt of diamorphine, a pharmaceutical form of heroin, for a long time but they were suddenly told that this medication would be stopped. Most had been receiving this medication for years and had previously had poor experience with other forms of opioid substitution therapies. They did not want this change and they were worried about what it would mean for their lives, just as anyone would be if their important medication was to be unilaterally withdrawn. However, the challenge we assisted on was limited to the mistakes the provider had made in doing this, but not to the person's right to the treatment itself. The challenge was expensive, it took years, and it provided no protection to the patients from other providers making the same decision again, but without the mistake, same mistakes. The success in this case also provided no protection to other people with other providers from having the same mistakes made in withdrawing their medication. This uncertainty cannot be the framework on which people's rights are based. It is one of hope rather than of security. The limited application of that case is often repeated in the work that our legal team completes. Through our community legal outreach services, we see the socioeconomic effects of drug policy as our advisors provide specialist casework support in social welfare issues. For example, in housing, we regularly challenge local governments for failing to help people who use drugs to access housing. As in many jurisdictions, there is simply not enough help available for everyone who asks for it. And so to qualify for help, people must pass through several gates, each of which is intended to restrict eligibility for help. One of these gates looks at a person's medical, health and social needs. We find that many, in many cases, a person's physical or mental health needs will be dismissed when it is also found that they use drugs. <laughs> While there is a danger in over-pathologizing drug use as a whole, it is not untrue that some of the most vulnerable people that we help have experienced trauma or are managing multiple other conditions. Requests from help from the people living them are then easily dismissed as they are just drug users. While we are often successful in our challenges to these individual decisions, they are only case-by-case -case wins and they provide no uniform rights-based protections. Those who go without help find themselves trapped. Their drug use results in local government refusing housing, and at the same time, their drug use makes it highly unlikely that any homeless shelters will accept them. If, they were, if there were not health problems beforehand, it will not be long before there are. We see a similar disdain to drug users in relation to government social safety nets. One client went into a residential rehab, and days later, their partner said they would be leaving them and the children once out of rehab. The client had to find a new home and prepare it before they completed their stay. They had to prepare it for their children. They asked for help and they were refused. The decision makers instead to prefer that the residential rehab should be treated as their home. The decision was so clearly wrong that even the children, not experts in social welfare law, could have told you that this was not their home. The refusal meant that the family was left owing thousands of pounds in rent arrears and having lost already, already lost one family home, they were evicted again. It was at this stage that the client was introduced to us. Our service successfully challenged the chain of decisions that led to the refusals. And the client was ultimately awarded all of the arrears and cleared the debt a young parent recently out of rehab and homeless. This case is not a win, 
it was an unacceptable, completely avoidable <clears throat> outcome of treating drug use or dependence as a moral failing and of decision makers refusing to look beyond a person's drug use and to provide help to people who are lawfully entitled to it. And we see this all of the time. Our work has its own problems. Those we are asked to help have to keep revisiting the awful treatment and trauma they have experienced so that we can help them in bringing their challenges successfully. They have to justify their entitlement to the small sums of money and the support that the state actively describes as having been calculated to be the minimum needed to survive. The precarity of this support cannot be the framework on which people's rights are based. It is one of hope and not of security. The legal risks to employment from drug use are well known to many, and a clear demonstration of this is the absence in the room today of someone we hoped would join us to share their experience. They were one of the people that we helped when their diamorphine was withdrawn. However, they were worried that if their employer was to find that they received diamorphine, due to them speaking with us here today, that their job would be at risk and that they would be targeted at work and harassed. Having already had one draining fight over their medication, they are understandably reluctant to have another. It is the absence of a rights-based approach that puts our clients at risks, and it means that our client is disclosing the medication to their workplace. For the same reasons, without human rights-based approaches, we will continue to witness the refusal of housing support just because of stigma around drug use. Without a rights-based approach, we will continue to see assumptions that someone who uses drugs cannot look after their children. Without a rights-based approach, we will continue to see people deny basic levels of income that they are entitled to. And without a change, People who, work, people who use drugs must plead to have even their basic rights and entitlements acknowledged, the right to respect to their family, of their home, of their employment, and to social security when things go wrong. The right to bodily autonomy, whether influenced by pleasure, adventure, despair, <laughs> transcendence, or for any reason at all. Our model of work has achieved real benefits for those who are able to access us, but not everyone can, and these benefits are often limited to the specific individuals that we are able to see. This is why we welcome the discussion today of the routes to operate, operationalizing human rights to ensure that people who use drugs have the same rights as everyone else. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, that very concrete um, analysis and obviously the challenges you have been describing uh, you face with your organization in the UK are clearly universal um, lessons for all of us. We're slightly behind time. Um, this is a message to Julie and Professor Miller. Um, let's move to the next speaker, uh, Julie. Yes, I will try to be as brief as possible. Um, so thank you all for being here and being here for an 8 a.m. side event. And really, it's amazing to see a full room. Um, so I've been asked to discuss the international guidelines on human rights and drug policy and the lessons that we have learned about how to move principle into action since their launch at the CND four years ago, which is just incredible how much the time has flown. Um, so very briefly, um, I'll cover what the guidelines are for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with them. They were developed over a three-year global participatory <laughs> process and span the entire human experience of drug control. The guidelines cover the full spectrum of human rights, many of which have already been touched upon uh, today. Um, the guidelines, and this is really important, um, are capacious enough to support countries that are beginning to imagine public health and human rights frameworks to respond to drugs, as well as countries that still retain punitive and or criminalized frameworks for responding to drugs. They've been drafted to reflect a global lived experience of the harms of drug control from cultivation to consumption, but they equally still remain bound by the current United Nations drug control treaties for better or for worse. Um, they do not invent new rights, but apply existing human rights law to drug control in order to maximize human rights protections, including in the interpretation and implementation of the drug control conventions. So the website is here. We have the guidelines translated into a number of languages. Please feel free uh, to explore um, in your own time. So what have we learned over the last four years? Alongside our partners at the UNDP, UNAIDS, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the World Health Organization and a range of civil society partners and national governments, we've convened four regional dialogues, bringing together ministry officials, civil servants, civil society, academia, 
and affected communities, as well as UN regional and country teams to develop national pathways for implementation. And what has arisen from these conversations are important and promising lessons to help advance rights-based change at the national level. So I'll just talk through a few existing themes and practical examples that we're beginning to document and reflect upon. And it's really just a taster um, for now. Uh, and we'll hopefully launch a broader collection of these promising approaches in the coming months. Um, so importantly, a transversal aim, lesson, critical element for success in engaging in a rights-based approach is really simple, but it's so important. And it's seeing all people as people. So bringing groups together in informal, depoliticized spaces is a valuable way to break through people's preconceptions about other groups or behaviors and to help everyone see people as people. For some pr participants in these dialogues, um, it's their first chance that they've had to learn about the lived experience of people involved with drugs rather than simply seeing them as criminals <laughs> or patients. Um, affected populations and civil society in turn may experience it newly the mechanisms, complexities, and process that influence how laws and policies come about and the true challenges of governance. So by seeing people as people with whom dialogue is possible, even in the absence of full agreement, progress can and has been achieved. And we've seen that even demonstrated in the small, small panel here today. So during our Latin America dialogue, members from the Latin America network of people who use drugs reflected on how the environment enabled them a space to engage with government officials and UN agencies as an equal and developing and considering ideas for the community to take forward. And today, land put are using the guidelines as a framework to develop a legal environment assessment tool to assist drug users and community activists um, in advocacy work related to global HIV AIDS targets and commitments related to people who use drugs and human rights. So opening up spaces for dialogue can enable courageous civil servants at the space to think about how to advance important policy initiatives and test ideas with a diverse community of stakeholders that are explicitly grounded in human rights, where human rights takes the center stage. Um, and with this diversity comes unique opportunities for partnership and application of these standards, of these principles um, in, in national policy development. In Brazil, the guidelines were used as a key source in the development of guidelines on drug trafficking as one of the worst forms of child labor in accordance with the ILO convention as part of a partnership between UNDP um, and the National Council of Justice. Sensitization and capacity building, which we've heard a little bit about um, from our colleagues in Ghana was a really important priority for many of the stakeholders throughout the regional dialogue process. Ensuring these international norms and their practical promise reach national stakeholders is vital. If you don't know your rights, you can't claim them. And if duty holders aren't sensitized to your rights, they won't promote, respect, protect, or fulfill them. Um, it's not the full piece of the puzzle, but it's an important starting point. So disseminating a static document, a static set of, of norms really isn't enough. Idea generation that's locally led and owned is critical to ensuring sustainable human rights capacity around drugs. In Nigeria, AfriLaw and the West African Drug Policy Network use the guidelines as a resource for training criminal justice officers, capacity building for people who use drugs, on advocacy to address torture of people who use drugs, and on criminal justice reform. In Albania, at the request of the Ministry of Justice and with partnership with the OHCHR, the Global Drugs and Development Program of GIZ, UNDP, our center, um, we convened a judicial training using the guidelines to train newly appointed judges in the country uh, on the ways in which human rights can support their role as members of the judiciary overseeing drug-related cases. And we've learned through feedback of this process from participants that because of this training, a case was dismissed citing lack of fair trial standards. And another defendant was given house arrest as an alternative on human rights grounds. So without this sensitization and training, these tools would not have been readily accessible for members of the judiciary. And we've heard in Ghana, that's a priority. Okay, I'm gonna close up. Um, so collaborative and cross-sectoral engagement <laughs> plays a critical role in building consensus and priorities in national context. We've heard about those core priorities 
for mobilizing action in Scotland and in Ghana across public policy sectors. And each country will have a different set of priorities to build. Um, on Friday, uh, I encourage you to join a side event where we'll learn about the first ever national level UN joint program on human rights in the Philippines, where a dialogue was also convened by the National Commission on Human Rights there to discuss with civil society, government, and other UN actors about how to use human rights to develop core priorities for action around that. And of course, we've heard from Ghana most recently about their national dialogue. And there's another side event that Ghana is hosting on Wednesday, uh, where you can Thursday. Thank you um, to learn. So there's so much to learn. And this is really hard work. It's not easy. Um, but and it's really been a privilege to play a very small role in this global project. So I hope that these practical examples and lessons can help contribute encourage and inspire more of this important work ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, Professor Miller, Alan, I'm turning now to you and asking you to yeah. stay within five minutes, please. Yeah, yeah. Um, I always like a challenge. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, thanks um, to Release for organizing this. Thanks to the co-sponsors, particularly member states, uh, Norway and, and Ghana. Um, the National Drugs Mission in Scotland, as you heard from the minister, um, represents a, a shift in public <laughs> policy towards drugs in Scotland, from criminal justice to public health uh, and to human rights. Uh, and the National Collaborative, which is part of the national mission and which brings a human rights-based approach to the national mission, is very much what it says on the tin here of this workshop today, um, turning principles uh, into policy, into practice, and working with those people affected by problem substance use uh, at the heart of that process. So I'd just like uh, very briefly to introduce you to the National Collaborative and give you some sense of what it is we're trying to, uh, to do in Scotland. The first slide that we have here, thanks very much for putting it up. Um, I don't feel under any pressure whatsoever. Um, <laughs> no, please relax. Outlines the vision of the collaborative. Um, and you see that uh, there for you. Uh, and it's also very much aligned with uh, developments in Scotland across public policy that a human rights bill is being introduced to the Scottish Parliament uh, very soon. And it will be bringing into our law a whole range of UN human rights treaties including the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, both healthcare and uh, healthcare determinants. Um, so that's going to be very significant uh, over the next period, along with the creation of a national care service uh, to make uniform throughout Scotland the same rights-based and quality of services uh, that need to be provided uh, to meet the right to health, availability, accessibility, acceptability and, and the quality of these services. The second slide, uh, please. Uh, the second slide indicates the, the two main purposes of the National Collaborative. Uh, firstly, to empower uh, those people affected by problem substance use, uh, and not only their voices be heard, but critically their rights be acted upon in the design of policy and practice. Uh, and then secondly, to ensure that these new rights that are going to be introduced in the forthcoming Human Rights Bill are made real um, in the drugs and indeed the alcohol uh, sector in Scotland and, and benefit the, the experience of those people um, in need of support. Uh, next slide, please. The human rights-based approach that we're adopting in Scotland is very much based on the UN common understanding of our HRBA, uh, which we've organized into what we call the panel principles. Um, so participation, accountability, non-discrimination and equality, empowerment uh, and legality. Uh, these are very helpful guiding principles, um, but to operationalize them, we are adopting the next slide. You will see um, a model of how to implement these in practice and to make these rights real. Uh, the roadmap in the top right hand corner um, is the process of implementation of this model of a human rights-based approach. It's been consulted upon widely in the drug sector and has received broad support that this is the sort of human rights-based approach and practice uh, that is giving hope uh, and confidence that it will lead to progress. So just to talk very quickly through this, this model, which has been tried and tested in Scotland in different contexts, for example, in 
historic child abuse uh, context. We start with the, the facts, um, the F, um, and that's um, what we're just about to embark on uh, next month for a period of several months. And that's developing an evidence base uh, and listening to the voices of experience of those people affected by problem substance use uh, and have that front and center. And then moving to the A, the analysis, then co-designing um, an analysis of what are the human rights at stake here and clearly drawing on the international guidance on human rights policy, uh, as well as the incoming human rights bill. And this process of getting the facts and the analysis will be shared by the change team, which is the driving force within the collaborative, made up of um, about 15 people of different kinds of personal experience of problem substance use in alliance with reference groups to ensure that all the voices and different experiences of women, of family, of children, et cetera, feed into this process and co-design the entire implementation. And then a broader network in which everyone who wants to be part of this implementation of a human rights-based approach it joins a leadership and learning network to share their experiences and ensure that they are included. And then that leads to the I, the identification of an action plan to respect, protect and fulfill the human rights that have been identified. And that will take the form of a charter of rights for those people affected by problem substance use and an implementation framework to make these rights real. So that will include, for example, workforce development and models of good practice of engagement with those with lived and living experience by service providers, uh, independent advocacy, complaints procedure, uh, scrutiny by oversight bodies, uh, and as a last resort where necessary, access to the courts for a legal remedy if all of that fails. And then leading to the final part of this cycle, the R for review, to review and monitor and evaluate the implementation of all of this plan uh, and develop human rights-based indicators again, co-designed by those people affected by problem substance use. And then that feeds into the sort of repetition of the cycle, the next looking at what the lessons have been from the attempts to implement it and how to continuously improve the implementation of a human rights-based approach. So um, it's a journey. Uh, we would like to share it with you as we go forward um, and as part of a broader global journey and, and learning from, from all of your experiences. Thanks very much, dear. Thank you very much, and thank you. Uh, we are one and a half minutes uh, before nine. Um, so it isn't time to really go into a, con a set of conclusions here. I would like to thank the, all speakers. We had, I think everyone will agree, uh, a remarkable set of interventions uh, today, a powerful um, interventions and and we can see how the momentum of human rights uh, of a human rights approach to drug policy uh, is growing it's remarkable as you said julie how it's been growing since let's say since angas 2016 uh thanks to to all of you um let me thank you all for uh having come here early morning uh, today. And let me just um, conclude by first saying that a key word that I have been hearing throughout every intervention is dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I was really fascinated to hear how dialogue started um, the whole process in Ghana and how in the uh, plan that uh, Professor Miller and Minister Constance, you outline uh, how that dialogue plays a, a key role. We also heard from you, Adisha, about uh, the, the need uh, to, um, to start the dialogue at all level. And so here we are, as we uh, learn the lessons from today, uh, let us, um, and I'd like here to actually quote uh, the remarkable um, intervention that we heard yesterday morning from the High Commissioner Volker Turk. He said, let us focus on transformative change, crafting drug policies which are based on evidence, which put human rights at their center, and which ultimately improve the lives of the millions of individuals affected. Thank you very much and enjoy your day.